Good morning, everybody. It's the Disco King here. Uh, today we're going to debunk a story. Now, you guys know we already debunked those Bakersfield doctors, right? What's really getting me nervous is we're in a pandemic and people are sharing fake news. But what really gets me is when medical professionals share fake news. And maybe it's not their fault because what we've become in this society is somebody shares it and we just click share. We don't research anything. We just click share. I do it too. I'm, I'm constantly getting people telling me, you know, what did you share that for, right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little background. I got into this YouTube thing way before most of y'all did, okay? I was researching all of these crazy, crazy conspiracy theories 15 years ago or more. Um, man, okay, you know, let's go back, uh, punch in Illuminati, or punch in uh, chemtrails, or punch in, um, oh my God, what's the name of that outfit? Uh, oh, I can't even think of it. The Masons, okay? And we did shows for them. But boy, you start looking on YouTube at some of this stuff, you can drive yourself insane. But you can also drive yourself insane watching Fox News or CNN or any of the talking head shows. That's why you're here, right? That's why you're following the Disco King because if you watch too much of anything or dig too far into anything, you're going to drive yourself absolutely nuts. So part of the reason I restarted the Disco King is to debunk things. And I don't care if it comes from a Repu Republican or a Democrat. I'm going to debunk it if it's somehow fake news or related to somebody making money. Um, so here we go. I don't want to get too far into talking about me because this is a very long thing. Um, and it's by Sherlock Beaver. And once I get the real, you know, that's, that's of course his Reddit name, but um, I want to give credit where credit is due, and I'm going to read this thing, okay? So the documentary begins by saying, Dr. Judy Mikovits has been called one of the most accomplished scientists of her generation. At the height of her career, Dr. Mikovits published a blockbuster article in the journal Science. The controversial article sent shockwaves through the science community as it revealed that the common use of animal and human fetal tissues were unleashing devastating plagues of chronic diseases. For exposing their deadly secrets, the minions of Big Pharma waged war on Dr. Mikovich, destroying her good name, career, and personal life. At minute 155 in the film, one of the most accomplished scientists of her time claims that she was arrested, but charged with nothing. At minute 158, she claims to have been in jail with no charges, which, if true, would absolutely violate the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. 205, she claims there was no warrant for her arrest, and at 213, she claims that her house was searched without a warrant, which, if true, would violate the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, and at minute 226, she claims that the stolen intellectual property was planted in her house in California. At 257, she claims the FBI are involved, and they were not, by the way. Her case is under seal so no attorney can represent her or defend her or they would be found in contempt of court, which if true would of course violate too many constitutional norms to enumerate. But yes, basically all of them are being denied according to her. The actual criminal charges versus wild claims by Dr. Mikovits. Okay. 2006, Dr. Judy Mikovits was hired as a research director for a private foundation association with UNR called Whitmore Peterson Institute for Neuroimmune Disease in Reno, Nevada, which was created by a shipment received at her lab to another researcher at the Institute on September 29, 2011, the details of which are outlined in witness Max Profit's affidavit. Dr. Mikovic's departure WI WPI discovered that 12 to 20 laboratory notebooks and flash drives containing years of research data were missing. You can't do that, kids, okay? In an additional statement through her attorney, Dr. Mikovich stated that she had received notice of her firing from WPI on her cell phone and immediately left Nevada for her home near Ventura, California. 
Dr. Mikovic denied having the notebooks, and in fact, Dr. Mikovic's attorney was requesting that the lab notebooks be returned to her so she could continue to work on the grants she won while employed at WPI to fulfill her responsibilities on these government grants and corporate contacts. After WPI reported a theft to the University of Nevada Police, an investigation was launched to a subordinate research assistant and tenant of Dr. Mikovic in Reno named Max Faust. During a sworn affidavit, affidavit detailing his own complicity in stealing the notebooks and delivering them to Dr. Mikovic, his sworn affidavit was the basis of the warrant for Dr. Mikovic's arrest in search of her home in California. I recommend reading this affidavit in full because it provides a lot of relevant details in both the civil, civil and criminal cases, and there's a link here for the document, which, of course, I don't, I'm not, what am I going to do, put a picture of it? Anyhow, following Dr. Mikovic's arrest, a second researcher, WPI, named Amanda McKenzie, also provided a sworn affidavit in which she attests that Dr. Mikovic asked her to remove laboratory samples and other materials from WPI and deliver them to another researcher who was a co-author of Dr. Mikovic's now discarded research paper and one of two of the four authors of that study who refuses to retract the study, the other one being Dr. Mikovic, according to her affidavit. Amanda McKenzie declined to do cooperate with Dr. Mikovic's plans. Contrary to Dr. Mikovic's claim in Plandemic Documentary that she was arrested without warrant, held in jail without charges, and, oh, well, my printer cut part of that off. Um, the criminal charges were later dismissed without prejudice pending the outcome of the civil trial against Dr. Mikovic for losses related to the stolen but mostly recovered notebooks. The gag order... Dr. Mikovic refers to relates to the civil lawsuit WPI fi filed against her, which Dr. Mikovic lost. She lost it, okay? And as a result, was ordered to pay attorney fees and damages. When you lose, because I had this happen to me, I had somebody pay me back my attorney fees, okay? That's the way it works in court. So you better, you better really watch yourself. Um, anyhow, she had to pay them damages, which she declared bankruptcy because she didn't want to pay it. Frankly, she should never have stolen the notebooks because she knew that her contract with WPI stipulated that all laboratory work and products belong to them. Now, I, the Disco King, I'm going to stop here. The Disco King had a no-compete clause at one of his companies. It was a very awesome, incredibly good job where... I worked from home, got paid a lot of money, and didn't do much. And I quit it because of the non-compete. So when you sign these clauses, when you go work for an employer, you really got to think about what you're signing. And if you think you're going to research things and bring them home to your house, you're stealing kids, okay? Okay, so let's get back to this. So she chose to declare bankruptcy rather than pay. pay. Frankly, she should never have stolen notebooks because it, she knew that her contract with WPI stipulated that all laboratory work belonged to them, including all important notebooks. Unfortunately, I think she felt like she had to steal them because at the time she was still trying to claim her study was valid and adjusting testing parameters for the XMRV virus that would create more positive test results from her patients. As noted in the edited abstract of her published study, the notebooks are essential documentation of other laboratory methods. In two sworn affidavits, Max Fost details how Dr. Mikovic told him that WPI was going down and that she was going to see to it at least half of 1.5 million R01 grant from the U.S. National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Disease would follow her to her new employer. Money involved in this, do you think? 1.5 million in grant money? Hmm. According to his affidavit, she stated she was going to try to move R01 grant and Department of Defense grants and stop the Lipkin study. The Lipkin study was a multi-center trial 
headed by Ian Lipkin, a virologist at Columbia University in New York, trying to prove or disprove once and for all Mikovic's largely discredited hypothesis that chronic fatigue syndrome is caused by a mysterious family of retroviruses, among them XMRV. The Lipkin study was commissioned by Dr. Anthony Fauci. And this is where Dr. Mikovich, true resentment and subsequent slanderous accusations against Dr. Fauci originate. Now, for all you guys that keep saying what an evil guy Dr. Fauci is, I have one question for you. Why is he working for Trump? Trump fires everybody. Think about that. All right, put that in your pipe and smoke it. So Dr. Fauci may have lost, may have cost Dr. Mikovich at least 750,000 in federal grant money by insisting on additional research related to repressor proteins that could inhibit HIV DNA from replicating. Her only published paper on HIV is not suppressed. In fact, this very documentary claims it's very first moments that Dr. Mikovich did revolutionize the testing and treatments of HIV AIDS. So did she or didn't she? Right? And there's a link here to her thesis. Dr. Mikovich did do some postgraduate DNA research in molecular virology at the Laboratory of Genomic Diversity National Center Institute, although she published zero research during her years there. Zero. If Dr. Fauci stole her homework, then where is the 1999 paper she claims she had in publication? She doesn't have a copy? Come on! You don't have a copy of this? Her research associates don't either. Huh. Weird. Anyhow, it was while working for WPI in 2009 that Dr. Mikovich published the only significant research paper of her career in the journal Science entitled Detection of an Infectious Retrovirus, XMRV, in Blood Cells of Patients with Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, in which she and four other colleagues claimed to have found genetic markers indicating presence of retroviruses, including one called XMRV, in the blood products of patients suffering from chronic fatigue syndrome. When no other laboratory could replicate the results Dr. Mikovich published she went back and altered the protocols for detection to make nearly all the results positive for XMRV, another retrovirus, which they concede was done in the edited abstract of their own research paper, link here, okay? In 2011, two of the original researchers, including Dr. Lombardi, had come to understand that the results they had published were only factually explainable by laboratory contamination and partially retracted their research, later petitioning to have their names removed from the study entirely. Four laboratories tested the samples for the presence of antibodies that react with XMRV proteins. Only WPI and NCI Rossetti detected reactive antibodies, both in CFS specimens and negative controls. Their MLV is not warranted at this time, Link. This did not stop WPI from bringing to market a laboratory test for XMRV at a cost of 500 to each patient for the financial benefit of WPI. So the funny thing is, I'm going to just pause right here, but, you know, Dr. Mikovic is constantly, you know, saying follow the money and all this stuff, right, with, with Fauci and what was she doing here? This kind of reminds me of the Tiger King or the girl that's trying to shut down the Tiger King is making more money by people looking at her tigers, saying she's an animal rights activist, which I just started watching that, by the way, and we're getting way off subject. Going back, we're going back, okay? So I'm gonna reread that. This did not stop WPI from bringing to market a laboratory test for XMRV at a cost of $500 to each patient for the financial benefit of WPI that even Dr. Mikovich did not believe was providing accurate results according to her testimony in Plandemic documentary that y'all are sharing all over the place, right? And, and there's a link here. In November 2011, Science, that's the magazine, right, published a nine-laboratory study that also failed to confirm XMRV or other viruses in the blood of, and therefore as a cause of, chronic fatigue syndrome in patients, link here. 
By the end of 2011, Science had issued a full retraction of Dr. Mikovich's published findings in their journal. Link here. Let's review the rest of the video for fun. At minute 7.40, Dr. Mikovich begins to falsely claim that the Beidol Act has ruined science by allowing grant recipients to retain ownership claims to their inventions and get rich. But in reality, when it comes to Dr. Fauci and university researchers similarly under contract with those institutions, by his contractual agreement and with NIAID, the ownership of those patents in fact resides with the agency and thus with the taxpayers, and that is who will receive all of this money. So Fauci isn't getting the money. So the taxpayers are getting the money. Okay. Um, that's who received royalties from the grants Dr. Fauci employed in order to make his discoveries that lead to those patients. Patents, sorry. Those royalties go one half to the NIA ID, a taxpayer funded agency, in order to fund more research grants like the one Dr. Mikovich has now been denied in light of her unethical practices. And the other half to drug manufacturers. So I don't see the problem here. You can't blame Fauci for AIDS deaths. Okay, and at 917, we're hit... With, and there's a link here, too. In nine, at 917 in the video, we're hitting with the biggest irony in the world when Dr. Mikovich criticizes Bill Gates Foundation for helping to fund research, making the foundation, not Bill Gates himself, possibly eligible for some claim if patients are filed and patents. I keep saying patients, sorry. If patents are filed... And Stanford v. Roche is the standard that would apply, as it does to all of Dr. Fauci's patents. When the place that Dr. Mikovich was fired, WPI, for misappropriating cell samples, the place through which she was seeking 1.5 million research grant from NIAID, is a private foundation that was founded by an attorney and her husband seeking a cure for their daughter's chronic fatigue syndrome. WPI contractually had the same rights under Stanford v. Roche to any invention or discovery of hers, and after she was fired for misappropriating samples and proven to be a thief of intellectual property, Dr. Mikovich was in danger of losing her own $1.5 million grant from NIAID. That's her real beef here, kids. That's the whole reasoning. You always got to think, when you see some viral video, what's the reasoning? There's usually money behind it somehow. So, what is the truth? Did Dr. Mikovich discover a dangerous virus causing plagues of disease, as this documentary claims, and then find herself silenced and bankrupted by deep state and big pharma? No, she absolutely did not. A man named Dr. Robert Silverman discovered that the XRMRV virus in prostate cancer samples and published his own findings attempting to link that virus to disease in 2006, link here. Dr. Mikovich met Dr. Silverman at a conference in 2007 and at that time, Dr. Mikovich decided to start testing her chronic fatigue syndrome patients for the virus using methods Dr. Silverman actually developed. Dr. Silverman has since stood by his discovery of XMRV, but has completely retracted his study linking the virus to the disease of prostate cancer. In their new study, in PLOS One, Silverman and colleagues meticulously retraced their experimental steps to determine the source of XMRV contamination in their cell structures, which has garnered praise From, okay, I lost it. <sighs> Dr. Silver, Silverman said I wanted to get some closure, okay? And uh, too bad Dr. Mikovich had no such ethics. This absurd documentary then goes on to show video clips of doctors claiming they are being pressured to record deaths as COVID-19, but included again is Dr. Arison, a now debunked California doctor who does not attend dying patients in any hospital and therefore is absolutely not being pressured to fill out death reports. At 1452, Dr. Mikovits validates 
the claim and the filmmaker makes that doctors and hospitals are being incentivized to report cases of COVID-19 and Dr. Mikovic cites the figure of $13,000 bonuses from Medicare. This is laughable. The overwhelming majority of hospitals in the United States are privately owned. So if any hospital is, pres is pressuring any doctor to falsely code COVID-19 claims with an expectation of financial gain, that would be Medicare fraud. Medicare fraud. Okay. Is this documentary seriously meaning to allege that widespread Medicare fraud is being perpetrated in U.S. hospitals and that doctors are complicit with? That's one hell of an accusation. Man, maybe we'll see all these hospitals get shut down. I mean, really, if it's fraud, somebody's going to prison over this stuff, right? So you better make sure you diagnose your patients right. Dr. Mikovic works in laboratories and apparently understands very little about medical billing for patients. But I've had to deal with mountains of medical bills and personal injury and medical malpractice. So allow me to explain a few things supplemented with some of the newest information as regards to COVID-19 coding and billing. Patients' conditions are recorded including, including using diagnostic codes for the purposes of billing and also empirical study. Diagnosis coding accurately portrays the medical condition that a patient is experiencing. ICD diagnostic coding accurately reflects a healthcare provider's findings. A healthcare provider's prog progress note is composed of four component parts. One, the patient's chief complaint, the reason that initiates the healthcare encounter. Two, the provider documents His or her, yeah, I just got cut off again. According to official guidance from the CDC, providers should only use code 07, U07.1 to document a confirmed diagnosis of a COVID-19 as documented by the provider per documentation of a positive COVID-19 test result or a presumptive positive COVID-19 test result. This also applies to asymptomatic patients who test positive for coronavirus Suspected, suspected, possible, probable, or inconclusive cases of COVID-19 should not be assigned U07.1 CDC emphasis in the guidance. Instead, providers should assign codes explaining the reason for the encounter, such as a fever, to Z20.828, contract with suspected exposure to, or other viral communicable diseases link here. Medicare and Medicaid do not have set amounts that are paid based on diagnostic codes. Dr. Mikovic is clearly as misinformed as half the internet right now, but here is where they are getting the numbers they are twisting into fiction for their own purposes. To project how much hospitals would get paid by the federal government for treating uninsured patients, we look at payments for admissions for similar conditions. For less severe hospitalizations, we use average Medicare payment for respiratory infections and inflammations with major comorbidities or complications in 2017, which was 13297 For more severe hospitalizations, we use the average Medicare payment for a respiratory system diagnosis with ventilator support for greater than 96 hours, which was $40,218. Each of these average payments was then increased by 20% to account for the add-on to Medicare inpatient reimbursement for patients with COVID-19 that was included in the CARES Act. Before accounting for the 20% add-on, Medicare payments are about half of what private insurance pay on average for the same diagnosis. In the absence of the new proposed policy, many of the uninsured would typically be billed based on hospital charges, which are the discounted list prices for care and are typically much higher than even private insurance reimbursement. Finally, new COVID-19 coding allows hospital providers to bill for these services. They provide at alternate sites such as parking lot testing sites, convention centers, hotels, something we haven't dealt with before, but for which they obviously deserve to be reimbursed. The $13,000 slash $39,000 figures are simply what it cost on average in 2017 to care for someone with respiratory illness in a hospital. It is not some bonus that anyone is receiving. So that is a lie. At 1713, Dr. Mikovic claims that hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine 
has been safely used for 70 years to treat a wide range of illnesses for which the FDI has approved its uses, including lupus, rheumatoid arthritis. But unfortunately, this is not the same thing as treated COVID-19. And Dr. Mikovich peers have come to very, very different conclusions about its application as a treatment for COVID-19. Data support the use of HCQ and CQ for COVID-19 are limited and inconclusive. The drugs have some in vitro activity against several viruses, including coronaviruses and influenza, but previous randomized trials in patients with influenza have been negative. In COVID-19, one small non-randomized study from France, discussed elsewhere in the Annals of Internal Medicine, demonstrated benefit, but had no serious methodological flaws. And a follow-up study still lacked a control group. Yet another very small randomized study from China in patients with mild to moderate COVID-19 found no difference in recovery rates. In this phase, lib randomized clinical trial of 81 patients in COVID-19 as unplanned interim analysis recommended by an ind independent data safety and monitoring board found that a higher dosage of chloroquine diphosphate for 10 days was associated with more toxic effects and lethality particularly affecting QTC's interventional prolongation. The limited sample size did not allow the study to show any benefit overall regarding treatment efficiency. Because believe it or not, science is even more competitive than the music industry and scientists still can't sell tickets to their show. In order to receive any money for doing science, one needs, to, needs an expensive education and to be able to publish Credible findings. Dr. Mikovich cannot even be honest or discerning in relaying the truth about her legal issues. So I do not know why anyone would take any testimony by this person about anything other than a large grain of salt, and that is the nicest way I can say it. And this was published by Sherlock Beaver. So I am giving credit to him and reading everything that he wrote. And I hope this guy uh, gives you a little bit better understanding of what's going on. And like I said, every time you share or repost something, you could be sharing something that's false. Most people don't have the time to look into it. And the Disco King definitely doesn't have the time to look into every one of these things. You guys are posting millions of things the whole entire Facebook has become this. So <clears throat> every once in a while, I'll debunk a story and look into it and waste a day for you. But uh, that's the story for today. Now that it's went viral and spread all over the internet, I'm going to post this. See ya.